philanthropy. And these are the three components that you, uh, where you define your work, philanthropy, policy, and movement building. Can you tell us how these uh, work together and how you navigate these three areas? Oh, yes. Um, I, I truly believe those are three ways that we can create social movements for good. You know, we can either craft policy and hopefully we do it with great intention so it can be there for all of perpetuity. But then we can truly, you know, give back and create movements by way of philanthropy and social impact. And then third, really, you know, mission building and creating followership so that pe- there's something that people can do to support, amplify, or create an their own movement. Those three things allow everyone to become a leader that will turn a moment into a movement. But when I go back to how I met everyone at Allen Media, it was, I believe it was like 2010, maybe, if memory serves me well, we were working on um, a policy issue that would allow all of Dallas's restaurants and bars to go smoke free. And so I think- Right. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. And we were successful. But I think it's the perfect example to show how those three things come together. You know, so we were we were lobbying policy to to create change. But at the same time, we were raising money to fuel that campaign issue and to keep it alive and to have ads in the paper and T-shirts for coalition members. And and also in the realm of, of philanthropy, you know, being at the American Heart Association as a volunteer institution, we were including the volunteers in that effort. So they were at City Hall with us every single time, you know, knocking on doors, talking to city council members, handing out one pagers. And then for that third piece, mission building, you know, we were spreading the message of the Heart Association, sp- spreading the message of what it would be like if people didn't have to worry about their health or a paycheck and creating social change through, you know, the lens of social norms, you know? So I really think that when a lot of people feel like you, maybe you can't really create change um, and do it from a place where all those are involved, that would be a perfect example. And again, it allows everyone to get in the game. Terry, you've been an executive at a major nonprofit. You've worked in large corporate environments also. So You know, what are some of the biggest lessons you've learned uh, through your career uh, from your work? (laughs) Well, I'm going to take it back to the newsroom. The first is always report facts. (laughs) 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 Always report facts. Right. And it, it it's still so true in lobbying. But, you know, when a lawmaker asks you a question, you don't have the answer. You just say you don't know because it could tarnish your credibility. And no matter what we do in life, you know, if we are working at a nonprofit or corporation, or we are just hanging out at the soccer field, our credibility um, really is a key that can open many doors. The the third thing that I I will add is, you know, my my friends laugh at me all the time. And, And this is a true story. When I decided to become a lobbyist, I had never met one. And so a mentor of mine told me on election night, 2002, my boss just lost, you know, I was this kid that graduated from college in three years and always had a job and always had a plan and didn't have one. And so I looked at him and I was like, I have to call my parents tomorrow and I have to tell them I don't have a job and I don't have a plan. And he looked at me and he said, just go and be a lobbyist. You can do that. And I looked back at him and all I could think of was legally blonde too. So I said, like El Woods, <laughs> you know, it was the only lobbyist I met mm-hmm. until my first day at the Louisiana State Capitol. And to be very transparent, I hadn't been at the Capitol since with Great Field Trip. And so that third thing is just be yourself. So you all have been on conference calls where I've had my, you know, my ink pen with a pink fuzzy top. <laughs> and, you know, I wear, you know, pink to the Capitol on days when I need a power suit. And just I am myself. And so when you're yourself, you can speak from a place of confidence. You can speak from a place of consistency. And on your worst day, people know that you're real. And so they're going to accept you for who you are at face value. This is Deconstructing Dallas. We are talking with author, lobbyist, executive speaker, Terry Broussard-Williams. When we come back, we're going to talk about her new book, uh, talk a little bit about 
movement makers. So hang with us through the break. Sean Williams, Ryan Trimble, we'll be right back right after this. Does your family love mac and cheese? If your family is anything like mine, when dinner time rolls around, your little critters are banging down the pantry door for a box of that cheesy goodness. Well, we here at Deconstructing Dallas have just the thing for you. That's right, it's Wisconsin's finest organic mac and cheese. Wisconsin's finest is made with real Wisconsin cheddar cheese and organic pasta that will satisfy all your cravings. Whether you like white cheddar shells, classic mac and yellow cheddar, or my kids' favorite safari animal-shaped pasta, you can't miss with Wisconsin's Finest. Find your own box of Wisconsin's Finest by visiting walmart.com today and support this outstanding local Metroplex company. So what are you waiting for? Get your box of Wisconsin's Finest organic mac and cheese today and get ready to hear your family say... I love mac and cheese! Deconstructing Dallas, Ryan Trimble, Sean Williams. We are joined today by our friend, Terry Broussard Williams. And before the break, we were chatting about um, movements and movement makers. And Terry, you said that your mission is to, quote, inspire others to create change. And you've issued calls to action for people to start their own movements. I wanted to really get at the heart of how you came up with this philosophy. I feel like there's a great story on your website. And for our listeners, please go to terrybwilliams.com, T-E-R-R-I-B Williams.com. It's a great website. Congratulations. But you share this this story. Uh, you, you hinted this story about your grandparents and uh, raising their church back from the ashes. Uh, can you tell a little bit about that and then where where movement makers come from? Yeah. So earlier I shared how, you know, throughout my professional career, there's a common theme. When you share information with people, you know, you give them access so that they can make decisions. And I truly believe that if you give people that information, they will choose, again, they will choose to make decisions that are best for themselves and their community. And so when I really thought about my own lobbying career, you know, again, I didn't have a pedigree. I had only been to a capital fifth grade, fifth grade field trip before my first day at work. And that, that probably like terrifies everyone at the Texas Capitol because Texas is such an institution where you, you know, you grow up there. But, but I really felt that anyone could be a leader that could turn a moment into a movement. And I truly learned that lesson from my family. You know, community service is my DNA. I grew up Every Saturday, my mother, her sorority sisters, my sorority sisters now, you know, handing out milk and cookies and punch. I would, that was my task while they taught children how to read. And, you know, I, so I just always saw the world through a lens of how might I give back. But going back to the story about my grandparents, they did not have much you know, on both sides of my family, neither grandparent had beyond a middle school education. We're talking about, you know, growing up in Southwest Louisiana during a time of segregation. Yet they always were able to give back. And my grandparents, my mother's parents did have a car. They could afford to have a car, but they might not always take that car because, you know, it costs money to put gas in the tank. 
But for the longest time, they would watch families just walk on the side of the road for, you know, five, six miles to get to church. So they, along with a couple of neighbors, said, you know, how might we raise a church in our community, the neighborhood called Truman, Louisiana? And so they did just that. You know, I say the cafeteria manager and the school janitor became church builders. And about 10 years ago, almost 11, the church burned down. And so my family teases, it was a month after I got engaged. I'm an LSU Tiger. I got engaged to a a University of Texas basketball player. They're like, you know, you're not supposed to mix school conferences. (laughs) So the church burns down and my parents then step up and say, if not us, then who? Who will continue the legacy of building this this movement? And so my my mother and my father got very engaged. My father led the capital campaign. He made sure the church stayed on budget, that the operations were on point. You know, everything was happening. And, and so, you know, I'm so reminded again that anyone could build a movement. But I was I'm also reminded every time I walk through the doors of that church that the movements we create, the legacies that we build, they are not for us, right? They're not even for everyone that we know. They're for the people that we don't know. So just three months after the church doors opened, we buried my father in that church. And, you know, so truly the people that got to enjoy that church, the people he never knew. Terry, you know, I know that there are more inspiring stories like that in your new book, Find Your Fire, Stories and Strategies to Inspire the Changemaker Inside You. As Ryan has um, alluded to, people on this, listening to this podcast, definitely need to check out your website. They can learn a little bit more about your book, which I learned some things, even that you've gone through through um, through this period of time, including t- changing jobs and getting a master's degree, getting hit by a sofa and suffering a traumatic <laughs> yeah. injury. So a lot of things that have happened to you, but I, you know, I want our listeners to to know about your book and uh, and you know maybe some of the takeaways they can get from from uh, reading it. Yes. Oh my gosh, writing this book was such a labor of love. I was in school working on my master's at the University of Pennsylvania, and decided to go back to just to double down on theories that are tied to you know social change and spent some time serving as a teaching fellow there. I I love that institution so much Um, and did get hit in the head by a sofa. I was literally lobbying (laughs) during the Congressional Black Caucus and was at a legislative reception when a man thought his cell phone was underneath the sofa. And it was one of those, you know, like, this was in D.C. D.C. And it was one of those sofas that they bring in for an event. And so... He picked it up, and I, I tell everyone, I, I, did, I knew I was short. I'm 5'2", but I did not know how short 5'2 was. A man raised a sofa over my head, <laughs> but it, it hit me, and I was out of work for a very long time. And it was during that time that I just felt, um, just felt this calling that I needed to learn something new. I needed to do something different, and that was when I made the switch to corporate lobbying in the tech sector wanted to do it because I feel like technology is a way that we can really change people's lives and create generational wealth. And I'm so happy I did it. I learned so much over the last year, but I was writing a book throughout all of this. So the book, as it started, definitely changed over the last couple of months I worked on it. So I I tell everyone, if you truly are looking to find your fire, you got to get a little pun in, but don't know how you want to do it or you might need that little booster shot just to feel like you you have all the tools and you can do it it's a perfect book for you i created what i call the fire starter formula which are just four c's finding your cause building a collective of people that can help you achieve your goal communicating and serving as a cultural ambassador for the movement that you want to move and then really doing the work, which is creating the change and using that lens to help you create any type of movement that you want. And and so I, I really tell people there are different ways that you can be part of movement building. You might choose to build a movement. We need people that 
you know, they see things that others ignore and they take action and they create change. But we also need people that 